So is manufacturing dead or is it just misunderstood? So if you look at manufacturing from a macro level in the U.S., it's easy to think that it's not going anywhere. But if you break down the pieces and you look at some of the changes that are happening, I think you can start to see that it's actually coming together, but it just takes time. We're talking about one of the biggest industries that exists. If you hear most of the so-called experts, they'll tell you that we can't bring manufacturing back to the U.S. And I think they're wrong. So I started a business in Detroit about two years ago, specifically with the focus on encouraging more domestic manufacturing. It's easy for people to say on a macro level that it's not happening, but if we look at some of the little nuanced things, you can see that it actually is happening and it's been happening for some time. I think it's really important to note that we don't need to, nor probably do we want to reshore everything. If you look at the trends of what's happening, that's not what we're gonna see. The opportunities are really more strategic and we're going to be seeing more reshoring around more critical industries, more the future. And really that's a lot of what this channel is about, the future and the making and how we're building these things and the opportunities to build better. So I think most would agree that it is actually a problem that we're unable to make a lot of the products that we used to make and that it's difficult for us to actually be self-sufficient as a country. So the first step in solving a problem is naming it clearly. And if you look at the small nuances that we need to address, you can address those problems and you can see that some of those problems are already being addressed. And the reasons why we don't see as much manufacturing in the U.S. currently is probably different than what many people suspect. There's a confusion about China. The popular conception is that companies come to China because of low labor cost. The truth is that is not the reason to come to China from a supply point of view. The reason is because of the skill. Most people think it's just because of labor. People think that, oh, well, we pay people too much in the U.S. and we pay people perhaps too little in other places. And this disparity is the reason why we manufacture in other places. Cheap labor is fundamentally a crutch and it's a crutch that inhibits innovation. I might even say that it's a drug that too many American firms got addicted to. Whatever your politics are, whatever you might feel about him, I think that it's totally true. This is actually a big driver for a lot of things, but it's not the only thing. The common misconception is that labor is one of the most important factors when it's really not, especially when you consider advanced manufacturing and that labor oftentimes only contributes about 10% of the costs in those type of examples. We're implementing more and more robotics, different things like that, and that really changes the dynamics of looking for more low-cost labor, but instead looking for more skilled labor. Now, some could argue that we don't have the right skilled labor here, and in some instances that is true, but in many instances what I've seen is the opportunities for reskilling and upskilling folks actually can happen pretty quickly. A lot of the technologies that are used in manufacturing today are a lot more accessible than they have been in the past. A lot of these very manual processes require so much more training and skill and a lot of these other aspects, it's kind of getting closer and closer to like playing a video game or operating a computer. So I want people to think a little bit deeper when you just kind of take these surface headlines like, oh, labor's too expensive or it's so much cheaper there. It's a factor, but not in all instances. Do you think about onshoring, reshoring as an opportunity or how are you viewing it? This isn't going to come back by shifting labor, really. It's going to come back with high degrees of automation. You know, AI is going to create a labor shift as well. And so as we bring more back, it'll be more and more robotically automated. The other thing that I think it's really important to consider is how we can innovate on how we're building things. If we're very dependent on low cost labor, we're not going to do that. What I do see is that there are a lot of opportunities for quality jobs and good paying jobs in relation to manufacturing. And I think a lot of people are missing that. And what I see being on the ground here in Detroit is that quite often it can actually be challenging to fill some of those jobs. And I think that's partly just because of the culture. 
Some people historically have thought it as a bit of a dead end job, but what I see is that's totally not the case. What I see is opportunities for people to get into manufacturing at an early age and rise up the ranks in pretty rapid fashion without massive investment in schooling and different things like that. And this is where you see other places have been a bit more successful. I spent a good amount of time in Germany and they have a lot of these apprenticeship programs. They've been successful in just raising up young people in manufacturing and advanced manufacturing. And I think that we need to look at some other places like this where we can model. Right now, manufacturing jobs in the US only account for about 10% of the overall jobs in the US. I think there's an opportunity for that to be a lot more. But many people, when they hear that topic, they say, well, oh, or you're gonna have people assembling iPhones or something like that. That's not the idea. Think about robotics, think about automation, robotic welding, whatever the case may be. It's a very different skill set. It's a very valuable skill set. The idea is that the value of that one individual could be exponentially greater, especially if they're able to produce more outsized returns. And the technology side really can't underestimate this. People talk a lot about places like China that, oh, they've been building up their industrial base for the past 40 years. And many people will say, we can't do that. It's gonna take us 40 years to do that. I don't agree. We're using very different technology to build that today. And you think about the power of some of the newer technologies that's coming online just in the past couple of years, particularly when it comes to AI and different tools like that, it's dramatically revolutionizing the efficiency and the way in which we build. This is really such an important detail. We focus so much historically on what we build. I think now is really the opportunity to focus on how we build. And you can see that there's actually a lot more interest in that type of topic these days. And it's partly where we're seeing more investment go into this space as well. How much can we expect electricity consumption to increase between now and 2050? We're looking at probably a 78% increase, right? And a lot of that big jump coming between now and 2030, the trend is, is shaping up a little bit faster. So it's a, it's a pretty steep you know, climb as we, as we start to look at things. Now, energy goes into so many different things, but the cost of energy is such an important detail. What I see happening now is the current administration seems to be pushing for lower cost energy. And really, a lot of that quite often might come from materials and uses that historically we've defined as not clean. It's a challenging paradox because it's like, are you going to be able to manufacture competitively without that, it's easy to brush it off and say, okay, yeah, we're gonna do everything with solar and wind, but really it's very location dependent. There's so many different factors that play into some of these clean energy sources. And what we're seeing is most manufacturing these days is not run by that. If you look at the majority of manufacturing is happening in China and the majority of that manufacturing is not happening with clean energy sources. Part of the reason why China has been a lot more successful is because they are able to control the regulation and they are more aligned on those values. I think it's really important for America to become a bit more aligned on our values and align what's really important and to tackle these really important issues with a very focused stance. Because if you ask some companies, they'd say, yeah, just keep it the way it is. Like we love low cost energy and the way that we're able to proliferate with all these products, whether they be throwaway or not. But we want to do what's best for most people and really help the country thrive. It seems like the current direction, we're going to see more and more energy come back online around coal and different things like that. But maybe we'll see other energy sources like nuclear and that sort of thing. So I think it's really important for us to consider how these things align with their values and consider what is actually viable in the near term. What I have seen is these weird paradoxes where we're producing solar panels using the power of the coal plant in China. Like, what's going on? And then we can't produce those same solar panels here because our energy costs are too high. This stuff doesn't really make sense. I'm not saying I got the perfect answer, but I'm just saying we got to think a little bit differently about this. And it's really my hope that we can speak 
more candidly about these things and not just brush them under the rug because they're uncomfortable to talk about. Ecosystem collaboration, which is collaborative approach where everyone in the chain contributes to overall success. How can we actually put these things in place? We need to consider how many barriers we have created in order for somebody to actually solve problems. To manufacture one thing, many different things go into that. And it's very infrequent that somebody's gonna be completely vertically integrated and do everything in-house themselves. Most of the manufacturing in the US is what we call high volume, low mix. But what we're really missing, in order to get there, you need this step before that, which is lower volume, high mix. And how do you do that? You really need to be very effective, not just in the machines that we use and the processes, but really a lot of it comes down to how effective we can be in communicating and actually getting work onto the factory floor and getting that actionable quickly. This is in many ways the way I see the change that happened in China. But when I look at things like Alibaba and the way that they connected these different manufacturing resources and they gave the world access to them. They changed the way that we communicate and transact. This shift has not actually happened in the US yet. And I do feel if we're able to create this shift, the opportunity behind that is pretty dramatic. If you look at other industries like computing and how the power of computing continued to increase as it became more accessible, as it became more connected. I see this happening the same way in manufacturing as things become more connected, as communication becomes more streamlined, the opportunity to really build these connected ecosystems that can function as a greater organized group as opposed to just functioning on their own. And the strength and the power in that collective is really immense. The things that are possible today really were unthinkable even five, 10 years ago. And the ecosystem is really what I'm working on building with Bloom. It's about building this connected system to bring together manufacturers, assemblers, warehousing, logistics, and really help to bring those resources online and make them more accessible for anybody to really build anything. And I think this is the future that could be at our fingertips if we build it right. It is so unfair what's happening to the American worker. They can't compete when you have that kind of unlevel playing field. We're talking about an opportunity, finally, to create millions of American jobs, middle-class jobs, if we could get it fair. The hottest topic of it all right now, which is tariffs. Pretty much all countries use them. There's a reason why it is a thing. The reality is this is one of the fastest levers you can pull to encourage and change where things are manufactured. This is a really timely topic in the US. There's a lot of things going on with the current administration, increasing tariffs and really getting more aggressive about these things. I think generally you can see that the US specifically is starting to protect and try to encourage its own industries by leveraging tariffs in order to lessen our dependence on other countries which might have a strong hold on us and might put us in an awkward position, particularly in this case, China. The important thing to note about tariffs though, it's not always helpful. It can be helpful on a macro level, on a micro level, a lot of times you're actually limiting domestic manufacturing because you can create an unlevel playing field, particularly if you have a global supply chain. I've been thinking about this way before Trump got elected and this trade war topic became a bigger thing. And this is something that I've actually been involved in for quite some time. One of the things I wanted to make sure that I call out on this video is something I see very infrequently spoken about. And it's basically the idea of how tariffs can actually put domestic manufacturers at a disadvantage if trade policy is not created in a smart way. If you have to pay for all those components that you're not able to produce locally and another country might not have to pay tariffs on those components if they're 
importing from a lower cost tariff country. Now, this doesn't make sense. This is clearly not right. And there used to be ways to address this. There's something called a free trade zone, which you can import parts. And as long as you're inputting enough domestic content, you can avoid tariffs on those pieces. I think we need this type of structure. These tariffs should encourage more domestic manufacturing. Unfortunately, what I see is it can be quite challenging to address some of these more nuanced pieces. I hope that we can see that in time. Maybe I'm a little bit too optimistic, but the good news is that we see manufacturing in a lot of other areas happening. We see a more robust ecosystem in many different industries. We're gonna bring back more and more our critical industries, things that might relate to defense or national security, things that might be of concern or challenge, like robotics, for example, something that we're getting deeper and deeper into. The idea that we're gonna have millions and millions of robots around, you really don't want to be in a situation where an adversary can flip a switch and then all of a sudden these robots are gonna turn on you. I'm back. But getting back to the terror point, I think it's important to really consider utilizing tariffs as a way to rebalance trade, to create a more level playing field. Because there's a lot of levers that countries can pull outside of just tariffs. So one is wages, one is rebates. So countries actually specifically subsidizing certain industries in order to get a stronghold and then you could raise prices as you have more control. The other side is energy costs, currency. Currency is a really big thing, particularly in China, specifically manipulating currency to keep costs low and there's a lot of these things. If you are really controlling the government in that sort of way, you can do that. In the industry that I was very much involved in, electric bikes, one of the things that they put in place was the anti-dumping policy because they found that China was dumping. And really tariffs are supposed to protect against these things, right? If a country is devaluing its currency, if they're giving rebates for export, they're really creating an unfair trade environment we should be doing something to counteract that. But quite often, people might take advantage of those opportunities. Some consumers at the checkout might appreciate that they have a lower cost, but they might not always know everything that goes into that. So I would argue that a lot of these points are really bipartisan issues. I know that we're quite often politicizing a lot of these topics, but I think it's important for us to consider that this is important for all of us. This is not just about fixing what's here now. It's about building something new and different for the future. When you look at the broader landscape, when you look at the ingredients that we can put into this, our opportunity to build something much better for the future exists right now and it's already happening. And that's what I'm really excited about. And that's really the story that I wanna be telling and really encouraging. And I think that we really need to, as a society, start to understand, to believe in that, and get excited about that. I'd love to hear others' perspectives. I know a lot of people have way more experience than I. I'm looking forward to bringing more folks like that onto the channel to discuss their experience. I think we need to look at this a little bit more broadly. I think we need to think a little bit longer term. It's another big challenge that America has that we think just in quarters. And the decisions that we make today are really gonna affect us long term and we need to be thinking about that future. I need to be thinking about my daughter's future and what's her experience, what's her real life going to be. So hope you guys will follow along. Really appreciate you sticking with us on this one and uh, I look forward to seeing you in a future video. Take care.